Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. I'm Eric Meyer, same. And uh, we wanted to do a special show about Interop. Good old Interop 2024. Yeah, we launched it recently. Yep. Woo! -hoo. And it was big news, right? And we can talk about it. it has like cool stuff in it and everything. Um, mm -hmm. But this is, we've been involved with it since the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, specifically though, like some of the things that we were seeing, like getting discussed on GitHub issues and social media, we thought, hmm, maybe we should do a little show about that. <laughs> There's uh, a lot of people sort of talking a lot about why certain ones didn't get chosen. And, you know, if you don't provide an explanation, people will make one up, right? I mean, they might make one up anyway, but definitely sure. if you don't provide an explanation, <laughs> There will be speculation to fill the void. So. Yeah, right. And that, I don't mean that like people will make something up maliciously. I just mean that yeah. like they'll fill in the gaps, you know, they'll fill in the gap. So, but the thing is we're on the committee that helps choose these. And so we have like a, an insider view, like we're, we can't actually talk in super specific terms, even because of rules that I guess we sort of helped design. So, right. Um, but we can talk in generalities, and I think that we can actually help explain and uh, address why we get what might feel like some even unintuitive to some people results. Right. And I think it's also worth talking about why there is some confidentiality in this process. Absolutely. I think it's key. There have been people who have said, why isn't this whole process transparent? And part of the reason is that for Interop to do its job the best that it can, Representatives of companies need to be able to say to the representatives of other companies in a confidential way, you know, this isn't going to be a priority for reasons X, Y, and Z, or we're really strong on this for reasons X, Y, and Z, and not have that become news stories. Um, people get fired for that kind of stuff. Right. But, you know, there needs to be a forum where the various teams can be forthright with each other. And they're just... There needs to be honesty in this process, right? Like a, a representative of a of one of these companies needs to be able to say, look, guys, in all honesty, we're not going to support this thing that we're talking about right now. Like, we will object, you know, be able to say that openly. Sure. That's true, by the way, of W3C groups, too. Like, yeah. uh, there is a facility to say that, you know, you're saying something off the record and wants to keep it so that we can't have really, really honest discussions if that's mm -hmm. that's necessary or appropriate. Right. But I think like far more than that, um, for me at least, like why do you not explain is because it's just really complicated. <laughs> and you could take so many things completely yeah. out of context and make them seem like evidence of something or or mm. you know to support some preconceived notion because mm -hmm. you only have filled in one gap right i mean you still yeah. have a whole like god of the gaps kind of problem here sure yeah i mean it's i actually suggested this year that we write a a sort of a like it's complicated and deeply unsatisfying <laughs> right you know why this isn't chosen but it just wasn't. And I wish we could tell you more. It's not a commentary on we don't support it or that we don't like it or anything like that. Just like the real answer is it's complicated. There's too much stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem that the project has faced, I guess, since the second year, really, maybe the third. But there are too many things to do them all. I mean, arguably, it's why the whole problem exists in the first place, right? Yeah. So the, so the problem is that there is just too much stuff and not just a little bit too much. There's like a lot too much. <laughs> yeah. CSS working group, like currently has over 3000 issues open at this moment as we speak. Wow. And it has closed less than 5,000 ever <laughs> in its whole history, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, they just pile up and then they pile up and you get, um, they have to work their way through the gauntlet of independent prioritization in these different engines. And then those are subject to everything. I mean, you know, maternity leaves and <laughs> sick leaves and, you know, this person got hired and this person got laid off and teams are changing and restructuring all the time. You know, 
there's no coordination historically to make sure that all of these things are making their way through engineering QA release cycles similarly. And so maybe very, very early in the web's history, it was a little bit easier to do that because there was just so much less stuff. Yeah, that's true. But also we weren't good at it then, right? I mean, we didn't, we didn't have good interoperability. And so now we wind up with this situation where say Chrome comes up with their thing and they do an implementation and they add these tests and it all looks pretty good. But then, you know, maybe Mozilla can't get to it for another year. And yeah. Apple is maybe unsure how they feel about it. Like maybe mm -hmm. they're like, well, we're, we're, we're kind of on the fence still. Uh, you can't give it the time to really figure out how you feel because you have to sort of manage all that time, like all of it, you know, not just the implementation time, but like how much time do you spend considering? And, and so then when the second one comes along, then the third one wants to take it more seriously too. Right. <laughs> so, right. so, you know, we, we could, if we just let everything to its own natural course completely independently, we wind up with sometimes many years between the first implementation and the last implementation. Mm -hmm. And by the time we get there, only then do we actually have all the tests that we should have had with the first one, right? right. Because every implementation that comes along improves the spec and the tests. And then, you know, we find that, oh, well, I mean, each one is passing 75%. And that's, you know, that's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not great, yeah, but it's not bad. So of, <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the pressure is off, right? Because like, oh, everybody's shipping it at least. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it turns out that in practice, a lot of times those are entirely ragged where each one of those 75% means that only 50% of this is actually interoperable for developers. Right, because everyone... So then you have another several years of pain. So, I mean, that's how interop came to be and, and why it exists in the first place. Yeah. The idea being that browser makers can coordinate on areas where they can agree. Yeah. You know, because like at the moment, I'm, I'm going to pick something that's outside of interop's remit, but at the moment, Apple's going real hard on VR, XR stuff for vision OS, which to be clear, not part of interop, but you know, maybe Google's not interested in that right now. Right. But to have a place where, you know, outside of working groups, I mean, working groups are where you talk about, should we do a thing? And if we're going to do the thing, how should it be done? Interop is where basically the different browser makers could come together and say, this is how a thing should be done, but we're not all doing it consistently. Let's get there. And maybe in five years, you know, VR, AR, XR, whatever they're called, will be a major feature because the Apple Vision headset will have gone through a couple of iterations. Maybe Google has its own coming out and so on and so forth. And and so then maybe that becomes part of Interop, right? But right now, part of the reason it's outside of Interop is that there really aren't interoperable standards for a lot of the things that are happening. There are some, but it's just not a place that browser makers are going to need to be coordinating right now. And many of the proposals for Interop this year were rejected simply, you know, on the grounds of there isn't a specification or there's not a finished specification. The specification is still under active development. It's not time for Interop yet. Or mm -hmm. there's a specification, but there are no tests. So we have nothing to test against. And that actually is a really important part of Interop is that there are web platform tests that can be scored and measured. That's where that uh, graph comes from on the Interop dashboard. And it's how browser makers basically are able to look at, you know, okay, if we're going to add this thing, how many tests are we going to need to pass? And how difficult do we think that's going to be? And mix that in with how important is it to the forward progress of the web? How important is it to our customer base, to the wider web, to developers in general? Like there's just, this is why, like you said, a lot of the reasons are complicated and unsatisfying because you have 15, 16, 32 different incentive structures that are all coming together in this one place. And sometimes they can be completely a contradiction and sometimes they can all align. And where they can align, that's where things get chosen. That's where proposals get, get accepted into interop. And I mean, we also, I think we had at least a couple that we turned down on the basis of 
this looks like somebody's attempt to use interop to get something standardized, but it's not standardized yet. This is not the place for that. Right, right, right. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, when we're talking about, like, why did we create interop and, like, what is its purpose? I think there's definitely a sense that, you know, like, part of this is about giving developers some kind of voice. And, I mean, I just want to talk about that a little bit. Like, everything about the web is about giving developers some kind of voice, right? I mean, like, mm. there's very little that is done that anybody is spending money on because nobody's asking for it. That's but, true. Yeah, but, like, how do you know that? There are many ways that you know that, and there's unfortunately not, like, a single funnel or even a single voice. And whatever voice you can get through Interop is, you know, through a lot of filters and also through the fact that, like, it's completely voluntary participation. It is like people in good faith coming to meetings and saying, we will do our best to do the running back and forth between our companies to help find the things in here that we can get agreement on that yeah. we think are actually potentially achievable, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like conceivably. I mean, that is not, you know, interop is also not a promise, right? Like it's not a promise. True. That everybody is going to get everything done. But it's like nobody in that room wants to hang some browser out to dry. Do you know what I mean? Like everybody wants yeah. to say, where can we find really good consensus that like we think it's at least possible that we can find the resources to work on this. And everybody's going to work on this together. And we're going to compete a little bit to achieve very high results. Right. But it's completely voluntary the, even w3c everything about web standards is voluntary standards yep so the w3c if the w3c could somehow determine which also by the way they cannot that every web developer on earth was just like agreed this is the one that we should do mm. like cannot compel google apple or mozilla to do that thing um, and true. even if they could somehow, definitely the people in that room are not the ones who could do that. Yeah. I mean, that is, you, you can't, right? I can't. Sure. And that, that is definitely a part of the equation here is that the people in the room, part of the reason they need to be honest is that sometimes they're saying, look, this is the reality in which we are operating, right? We are not in charge. We do not make these decisions. If our company has said, you know, we're never doing XR don't even spend five minutes talking about it. The people in the interop room are not the people who made that decision. They're the ones who have to communicate to other people. Yeah, I know you really want to do XR VR, but we have been prohibited from doing it. That did not happen to be clear. I'm right. again, using hypotheticals from way outside of what interop was about and considered, but you know, it's illustrative. I have a sense that somebody might, hear that and assume that XR is just a stand-in for some other thing. Which is but not. I will just assure you that it is not that either. Right. Nope. Like basically there was none of that happening in in, in interop. I think it's okay to to say that. But, but but it is important to, you know, for people to be able to be honest and for mm -hmm. company to say, hey, our team has a backlog already for the next six months. And we're <laughs> right. all, we're also like in the middle of some major part of our engine rewrite. And like, as much as we are supportive of this, like it is just not conceivable that we can do this. But, but like, then there's the question too, of like, how do you judge any of these things? Because there are like, we open the door and we get, I think there are 108 submissions. Yep. And like, okay, now if I handed that list of things to a thousand developers, mm -hmm. I would probably get a thousand different orders, right? I mean, <laughs> like it is really, really, really hard. And then if I asked every one of those thousand to explain, why did you put, you know, masonry layout as number 23, but summary mm -hmm. details as number 21, mm -hmm. like the answer is uh, it's complicated and it takes a really right. lot of thought and time and reasonable people can disagree. Right. Sure. And I mean, I can say this with absolute certainty because Eric and I do this ourselves and try to come up with like an initial stab at it. And yeah, we take the list of proposals and ex basically do 
stack ranking. <laughs> like, and we have we're two. gonna put this one on top, and then we can keep going through the list, and then we find another one. I was like, oh, okay, is this should this one be on top, or should it be just below the one that we put on top before, or maybe it should be a little further down. Maybe it's a top five, but it's not a top three. And okay, great, we've placed that one, and then you come to the next one. I was like, yeah, this this is. Yeah, this is in the middle somewhere. Yeah, and we and we don't always agree. No, we we sometimes disagree. I'm trying to remember what we. There were at least a couple that I would put it about here, and you said, "Oh, really? That surprises well, me." I would put it much higher or much lower or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I I can tell you one is the okay. one of the ones that everybody was talking about is JPEG XL. Mm. Uh, we had kind of different takes on where that should stack up in terms of you know like which things are higher on the list. Yeah. Now you get into like, what are the kind of things that you consider? And the one that is pointed out a bunch is like JPEG XL had the most stars, the most GitHub stars hmm. and it wasn't chosen. And like some people think that's very damning, you know? Right. But and that's a terrible way to know anything other than it got a lot of stars. Right. And Do you know, like what was among the top few with stars was MathML. Hmm? It had way more stars than navigation positioning, CSS anchor positioning, CSS nesting, CSS style queries, masonry layout, declarative shadow DOM, custom media queries. Like, do you believe that that's really the order that developers like they want MathML more than all those other things? Right. Would the sum total of developers, if you could get them somehow all in one stadium and get a poll out of them, would they rank MathML above the Navigation API or Declarative Shadow DOM? Yeah, probably not. Yeah. When we uh, also asked on you know social media, that was not reflective, actually, of what people gave us as feedback. Very few people had MathML <laughs> as above those other things. Right. And I mean, I'm saying this as, you know, like Egalia is very behind MathML. It's very important mm -hmm. to Egalia. We understand why it's important. In fact, this is one of those things. Like when you're picking this, well, you could make an argument. Hey, maybe browsers should all come together and prioritize this really highly because you have ignored it for more than a decade. You know, you haven't spent any funds on it. Right. So maybe now we should do that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I mean... We also, we had the discussion when we were ranking MathML. It was like, we think it's really important as a company, us individually. Yeah. I like, I think math markup is very cool and would give a lot of benefits. But we had the discussion, like sort of the real world discussion of where does MathML actually fit, not only amongst all of these things, but sort of in the regard of everyone involved in the Interop project, right? Because... Do we want to rank it number three, let's say, because it's so important to us and just let that stand? Or do we want to maybe put it mid-pack because we know that's where everyone else is going to put it and lend our weight to something that actually has a chance of moving forward? Right. And reasonable people can disagree about how you approach that. Like, do you just absolutely do everything based on principles in a vacuum? Or do you do everything based on what can actually get done in the yeah. next 12 months? And there are good arguments either way. Yeah, and even even in a vacuum, I mean, you have to weigh, okay, well, yeah, it's been ignored. We have interop issues. There's been a lot of community. I mean, like the community itself outside of web browser vendors has spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars, like including two individuals who spent over a hundred thousand dollars out of their own pocket. And, and, you know, like I've said this a bunch of times, like this is the language that we use to express the maths and sciences, which are really important mm -hmm. in research and stuff, which is like the web's origins. And, you know, like I said, kind of a little bit snarkily during the process, like, God forbid we had like a pandemic or something and you wanted to share research <laughs> via the web, mm. you know, like, wouldn't it be really great if we had actual native math rendering? And I think, yes. So, so like philosophically, it is important. Yep. There are good arguments you can make why it's important. On the other hand, masonry layout is popular and it currently requires JavaScript. We've gotten math out of where it definitely requires JavaScript. You can do a lot of math rendering without JavaScript now. So at least there's that, you know, you have to compare those two things. 
And you could say, well, I mean, I see masonry layout kind of a lot. <laughs> and the ebb and flow of much of the web is not math content. So maybe that's more important. That's a reasonable case. Maybe masonry layout is more important. Maybe yeah. not not more important, but maybe it's a better choice. Mm -hmm. Or here's why you should prioritize off-screen canvas. That's That one is incredibly unintuitive to me. But then when you hear the reason, you're like, mm, wow, that's a really good reason, actually. <laughs> and masonry layout, we ended up not selecting this year, I think. Because, uh, again, specification is still in flux. It's right. not quite at the point where interop is the place to be working on it. You know, hopefully next year that'll be worked out and there will be tests and it can be uh, considered for inclusion in Interop 2025. But we're not there yet on masonry specifically. Yeah. I think there's another aspect of this too that mm -hmm. is there are over a hundred things on this list. Yep. And we know we're not going to pick anywhere near like a hundred things. But if you just pretend that like money is no object when it comes to actually, if we choose them, right? So what we need is to like, just fully optimize this by taking in every possible piece of data to the fullest extent that we can. So we try to find like the optimal path through everybody hmm. uh, gauntlet, you know? Um, like even in that case, you would have to be deeply familiar with all hundred and however many of these in order to really reasonably make that case like i also see sometimes people make the case that like oh well like you didn't consider this carefully enough you know but yeah that is goes back to like the thing i said at the beginning where like not everybody can afford to pay the same level of attention to all of the things and so there probably is a, a bit of a bias in here yeah and i mean when you consider how long would it take for an entire engineering staff to go through a list of 100 plus proposals mm -hmm. and just with like within that engineering team say which ones they think are doable and which ones are not not even ranking them literally just saying which ones do we think we could pull off in a year and which do we not or which do we think our engine can even handle and which do we not Right. How long would that take? And uh, that's at least a week. And it, I mean, yeah. it's impossibly complicated too, right? Because like, sure. if I ask you like, which of these things can you get done? Knowing that the list is five times too long easily, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like you're going to say, well, I can do A and C and D, or mm -hmm. I can do B and D, or, right? right? I mean, you can't just say I can do X, yes or no. It's like, it depends what else is chosen. Yeah. And like I say, it would be at least a week of an engineering team working through this, possibly longer. And literally for that entire time, they would be doing nothing else. Like how many times can you pull the engineering team off of what they're doing for a week to have this conversation? Because if, if the process goes to multiple rounds, it's like, okay, we, we took that week a couple months ago and now we've narrowed the list down by half and we got to go through them again. But you can't just have all the teams go and say, well, you know, this is the list that we've come up with and then assume that you're done because each team is going to come up with a different list and let's just make it easy and say, let's, the, it's just three engines. There are more people than that involved, but let's just say three teams do that. You probably have a list of 30 things, which is probably more than any one of those teams can actually commit to in the next year. So you got to go through it. Again, and this is one of the many yeah. challenges of, of, of winnowing down this list to a list of things that lends to the consensus that these are things worth working on that we believe we can make significant progress on in the next 12 months. Because it also doesn't do any good to say, yes, that's a great idea, and then not actually do anything about it because you have other stuff that has higher priority. I mean, just from a public image standpoint, nobody wants to go in saying, yes, we were going to do this. And then at the end of the year, when you check their scores, they have not changed at all. That just makes you look bad. But even beyond that, these are people who genuinely want to deliver on the promises and make things better for developers and users. You know, people can be cynical about that. And I'm sure some people are, they're like, oh yeah, sure. But these people really do care about that kind of thing. 
And so they, you know, they don't want to have something included in interop. And then a year later, basically have broken that promise. I mean, I feel like you can look at the time before interop and the time to now, and you can say things really do seem to have improved a lot. Yeah. And, you know, that goes both in terms of some legacy problems that we had that were painful, like the initial first year compat 2021, where, you know, we we're dealing with, you know, Flexbox and grid issues and stuff like that, primarily right? Uh, through even now things launching with much higher quality interop. And you can say it's easy to see why you could attribute that to. Well, sure, because we all focused on those things for this year. That's much, much more efficient. Like if you look at a browser waterfall, like when you can parallelize things, it gets done a lot faster, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, when they have to go serially, they can really, really drag out because things that you yeah. could be only doing way at the very end, you could have started much, much earlier. So, And um, really, one of the advantages of that parallel approach with everyone's working on it at the same time, the tests get much better, much more quickly. Yeah. You know, somebody creates a test and then another browser team you know, which is checking their work against the the tests says, wait, suddenly we're failing this test, this new test or this new set of tests. Why are we failing that? And they look at it and they say, no, these tests are wrong. They go back to the other browser team. And the other browser team says, no, look at the spec. It says right here, da, da, da. And they, but this is how we read the spec. And then they can go to the working group and say, we had two different readings of this. What's the actual answer? The working group ideally says, this is the answer. The tests are either updated or preserved as they were. And um, whichever team on the other side of that has a uh, browser that's failing tests fixes it. And I think that's a that's a crucial component to that uh, efficiency that you were talking about, that when mm -hmm. things are being done in parallel, it's not just efficient in terms of time where you sort of go from zero to mostly done in the course of, let's say, a year, but also you go from zero to much better done. Um, and you have a lower chance of, at the end of it, having incompatibilities that can't be resolved, which Absolutely. we've seen in the past, right? Where first team to do a thing, first browser to implement a thing implements it. And then other browsers come along later and try to follow that implementation, but they have disagreements with how the spec was interpreted. And then you end up with, well, the working group really wants this to be the answer, but that would make the spec incompatible with this implementation that's been there for five years. And that's a problem or can be a problem. Sometimes browser makers will say, oh yeah, according to our telemetry, nobody's actually using this anyway, so it's not gonna hurt us to change it. But sometimes they'll say, nope, our users depend on this. We cannot change this. And then what do you do? Yeah, totally. And to your earlier point about people want to see it succeed, I think that there's a, a part of that that you can say isn't just like about wanting to look good to the larger world, but also wanting mm -hmm. to keep the project going, right? And so if you go out there and you're like, okay, so we're just going to say yes to everything, and then you only can hit on like 20%, like you're organization probably doesn't want to continue this effort, right? Mm. But if you go out there and you like things look reasonably good and like you get mostly positive press from this and also your engine is getting better and people are happy about it, then yeah, that's an effort that we want to keep investing in. Yeah. So I think that, you know, we're all just kind of aware that it doesn't really behoove anybody to like promise a bunch of things that we can't actually even remotely hope to deliver you know we can right. be we can be optimistic we can be whatever but it's just like when your boss is like well i need an estimate how long is this going to take you're not helping anybody if you're not telling the truth there right correct so we want to do as good a job at those estimates as we can and um mm -hmm. but then you know like at the end of the day you do have to like pick some things and even if you could explain all the rationales for why you <laughs> pick things at the end of the day, we are doing, you know, a little bit of like averaging of a million different opinions mm. and, and inputs. And, and so that is how you get to some things that are like, even to us occasionally like, wow, that's, wouldn't have expected that, but that, yeah. that is the result, you know, like we came up with the algorithm and you put the input in and this is what came out the other side. And 
okay. I mean, it's not a bad yeah. result. It's just like not what I would have expected. Yeah, yeah right. It, you know, sometimes you get surprised by what there's actual consensus on. You could start the process when you look at the list of 100 and and probably pick, yeah, there's never going to be consensus on blah, 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 blah. And then if you compare that list at the end, you probably find, oh, hmm, one of those actually is one of the ones we picked. Weird. Yeah. There's, and I, I, I mean, it is a lot like averaging and things that are like difficult to explain, like, you know, um, I think in any country who's elected to, to office, <laughs> like, mm. yeah, I mean, they're the ones that, you know, survived all the things and turned out the vote. And it, it doesn't mean they're the best person for the job. It doesn't mean even that the majority of the country actually likes them just yep. means that that's, you know, what the process turned out, you know? Yeah, exactly. And we should also say interop is not a constraint. Like browser teams are not going to work only on interop and nothing else. And things that didn't get picked, a browser team might uh, end up hiring somebody who part of their deal is that they really want to work on that thing. And so they do it and push things forward. So if, if anyone had the idea that this is sort of a browser teams giving a list of here are the things that we will work on. No, it's here are the things that we agreed together that we could work on making them more interoperable, which is a very different thing, right? So, you know, if, uh, and, you know, masonry layout, I'll go back to that one since that one didn't get picked because the spec is still under development. Let's say the spec gets uh, finished up in, you know, the second quarter of this year and it's really solid and we know people really want it. Can we make this happen? And that could easily happen in the, you know, the latter half of this year, uh, if that's how things turn out. And so it could end up being that, you know, that layout type is never part of interop because by the time the next interop rolls around, someone proposes it. And, uh, we look at the test and say, yeah, everyone's already above 95%. We're, we're good here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, and, yeah, sorry. And let me be clear. I'm not making a prediction about masonry layout, right? Do not take that as a, oh, masonry will be done by the end of this year. It may not. The spec may not be done by the end of this year. It's just that is the kind of thing that can happen where just because a thing got passed over for interop does not mean the browser teams will then just ignore it and not not look at it again. Yeah, I was looking really quickly to see. I wish that I had thought to prepare this because it's like such a good point. But I'm sure that if we looked, we could find something that was like, actually a pretty exciting thing that happened that wasn't on interop 2022 or wasn't on interop 2023 but mm. actually still happened that year and actually got interop independently i i bet that if we looked a little bit we could find something that um just got done because browsers were like yeah i mean we have the resources or it was already on our on our radar to do it mm. But, you know, we were just waiting for this other thing to come unblocked. We didn't think that we could do it. We didn't know if we would have the budget. So-and-so was on parental leave and they came back and suddenly, we, you know, we hadn't accounted for that resource and now they can get it done, you know. I mean, all these things are, like, totally unpredictable. And obviously, all the engines want to do as good a job as they can. This is not a complete exhaustive list. Everybody is going to try and do as much as they can. And will prioritize absolutely things that are not on this list. Like if you think that Chrome is only going to ship the stuff on this list, <laughs> think again. Yeah. Anyway, I think we could probably talk about this just like literally forever. Yeah, um, probably. But I just thought it was worth us like taking some time to talk about how you get to there. Um, that a lot of the speculation, I don't want to get into which speculation or whatever, but like, I think we can just say like, Assume it's wrong. <laughs> the The chances that it's right are infinitesimally small. And uh, I will, I feel fairly comfortable saying it's okay for us to say that most of the things that I have seen are incorrect. <laughs> and I, I wish it were not um, phenomenally complicated. And every year so far we have had joint discussions to talk about like, is there a way we can make this more somehow more explainable or transparent or whatever because you know for the most part i think everybody 
doesn't want to have it's complicated be the answer. You know, it just is. Yeah. Sometimes reality is less satisfying than we would like it to be. Yeah. Do you have anything else that you think we should address here? I, I think we can say the interop team is taking feedback uh, on board and considering how to do better uh, with communicating and that sort of thing uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. But it's always going to be on some level disappointing to a lot of people, <laughs> either because your favorite thing didn't get in or because it doesn't feel like it's enough. I think it's worth celebrating that the effort exists at all, that there's any effort between these teams to coordinate in any area because there sure was a there sure was a time when that was not at all the case and you would have been laughed out of the room if you had suggested that maybe the the different browsers should coordinate even a little bit so yeah it is as you say huge that this uh, effort exists at all it's an iterative process it's never really been done in this way so the team is learning as they go you know trying hopefully. our best hopefully improve not just the web, but also the process of improving the web. Absolutely. I was just thinking before we get off here, I know everybody has already done shows covering like what is in, you know, 2024. I don't think mm -hmm. we need to do that. We already have talked about a few of them, like nesting, declarative shadow DOM, custom properties. Right. Um, but uh, I think you can say that like at least – a number of them are pretty predictable. Popover, I think we would have predicted. Mm -hmm. um, declarative Shadow DOM, probably. CSS is nesting. Like, they're just, like, very popular in all the venues. They're mm -hmm. maybe not the top of anybody's list, but very near the top of a lot of people's lists that we saw. So right. I don't think that anybody was surprised with some of those. Other ones, maybe they were. But the thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, we did this, what, uh, couple of weeks ago. So the numbers that we have are almost an example of the thing that I said at the beginning. So Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Safari, the numbers are 75, 73, 58, 75. But the interoperable intersection of those things is 48%. Mm. So at the end of the year, that number is going to be definitely in the 90s. That is the goal. On all of those things. I don't think that there ever has been a year where it wasn't up like in the 90s, right? Okay. Yeah. The um, interoperable score, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a number of good features in 2024. And the fact that we can go from like close to zero <laughs> to up very close to 100% within the span of a year across all these engines is, I mean, I just can't overstate how huge I think it is. Um, so I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think we got to celebrate all the good that it does do and also continue to iterate and work on how we do even better. All right. So thanks for uh, agreeing to chat with me about this, Eric. <laughs> Hopefully people found it enlightening or at least interesting. Yep. Catch you next time.